So we have an opportunity here today to hear from one of the great business leaders of the world, the great visionaries of the world, about social entrepreneurship, about adventure, about business, about the Virgin Group, and about outer space. So please uh, join me in welcoming Sir Richard Branson to London Business School. Um, well, I thought rather, rather than making a speech, it might be better to um, interact with you and find out what sort of questions um, uh, you'd, like, uh, you'd like to ask of me. So I think we've got um, six roving microphones, and um, if anybody would like to throw out some questions, I'd be happy to, um, yeah, happy to answer. Um, presumably you're from all over, all over the world, are you? We're, we're every, every, every country represented <laughs> here. But. Um, they, they are indeed from all over the world. I did, I did this once in Japan. I, I, I flew all the way to Japan, went down to um, a place called Miyakonojo in the south of, France, uh, south of Japan, where, where university students wanted to ask me questions. And I said exactly what I just said. And for five minutes, not one person put their hand up. And uh, <laughs> so I then said, well, look, I'll tell you what, first person who puts their hand up gets two upper class tickets to London. And from <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we were off. <laughs> I, I, I think I saw a uh, head right back there okay. immediately, actually. So, yes, where three is. Right. Shall I, shall I stand over there so I can see you? Okay. Uh, so, Richard, I'm uh, David McGrath. I'm one of the uh, executive MBA students uh, here at London Business School. And uh, our class uh, is actually finishing up uh, our last two days together. And uh, we're very honoured uh, to be here with you today. But one of the things that we're looking at is making meaning in uh, a modern business world. And I'm interested to hear your perspective as to being a serial entrepreneur, how you make meaning in the businesses that you enter, and how not only are they there to make a profit, obviously, for your, you know, your, your group and your shareholders, but also how do they contribute back into the community. Thank you. Um, well, it's, uh, it's, it's a good question, and um, I think that, uh, you know, initially when you set up in business, um, r really the only, there's only one thing that matters, and that's survival. And, and, and I think if you're starting a business from scratch and you, uh, and you haven't got any financial backing, um, you've just got to survive. If you don't survive, you can't uh, make a difference in the world. You can't employ people. Um, you, can't, you can't build your business. So. I think for a number of years, um, you know, you shouldn't be worried too much about, um, you know, sorting out the world's world's problems. Uh, you've just got to make sure that uh, you stand you stand on your own two feet, and uh, and you know you can get you can get your fat cash flow going, and you can be one of the few survivors because most people who set up in business uh, fall flat on their face. I think something like, you know, 90% of new businesses that are set up in Britain uh, don't survive, so it, it's not easy. Having said that, then I think you know l later on in your career, um, you know if you um, start making you know some money and if you, and, and and if you you know if you if you know that you've got your feet firmly on the ground, uh, then I think you know enormous responsibility comes with um, becoming a successful uh, entrepreneur or businessman because um, you know unlike becoming a successful doctor or uh, well, actually a doctor maybe not be the best example but a successful nurse or journalist or, uh, you know, or, or, or success in any other field, extreme wealth comes with becoming a, a successful entrepreneur. Um, and, uh, and if capitalism is to, be, um, you know, is, to, is to be given a good name rather than a bad name, um, it's, it's essential that, uh, that capitalists and entrepreneurs uh, give back to society. And, uh, and you can do that in a number of ways. I mean, you know, one, one way is obviously to uh, reinvest that wealth in creating new businesses, new jobs, uh, and, and that in itself is, is, is important and something which I suspect you know, most people in this room will do. Uh, the other thing is to actually you know, think about you know, the, the money that you're spending and, and maybe spend it, invest it in, uh, in, in socially responsible areas so that, so that, uh, you know, so that it, it, it can actually um, you know, so I mean, for instance, we talked. Um, there was a mention of ethanol earlier. You know, look, look at look at sort of clean fuels rather than unclean fuels to invest in. And surprisingly, you might find you can make 
as much money that way anyway. And then obviously the third thing is, that, is to uh, you know, tackle some of the more fundamental issues that, uh, that face the world. And, uh, and a successful entrepreneur or businessman, I suspect, can have more uh, effect in tackling some of the social problems in this world than politicians can. So I think you, you can find yourself in a, in a stronger position. Um, but thank you. I look for number one, do I? I <laughs> um, my name's Patrick Moore. Um, I was at the school, left in 1999. Um, it's really developing a theme. You mentioned ethanol. Uh, I'd be very interested to hear more about how you're getting on with the bioethanol and whether you're looking at other biofuels, biodiesel, that sort of thing. Just that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm in the airline business and I'm in the train business, and you know, we, we obviously uh, do our fair share of damage to the environment. Um, uh, equally, you know, fuel prices have gone up by four hundred million um, dollars a year in the last two years. That's what what, what Virgin is costing Virgin in excess than it did two years ago. Um, so. You know, as a businessman, we examined, um, you know, what can we do about these increased fuel prices? Um, and, you know, you can no longer hedge because they've stayed high for two years. So hedging, hedging possibilities have effectively run out. Um, so we, we then examined fundamentally, um, you know, what was the cause for these high fuel prices? Was there anything we could do about the cause? I mean, could we take OPEC to court for, you know, for... Um, colluding, could we, um, you know, if there's shortage of oil refining capacity, could we set up more oil refineries to try to, you know, break break the logjam on the oil refining capacity, and uh, and actually that's what we decided to do. Um, and then I met um, a man called Reed Detchen who works for Ted Turner. Uh, Ted Turner set up um, a small fund at, at the United Nations to try to uh, make businessmen more more aware about. Uh, in the environment, and and he said, look, you know, you know, if you're going to set up a refinery, why set up a refinery producing more dirty fuels? Why don't you set up a refinery that's um, uh, producing clean fuels? And so, for the last two and a half years, we we, we set up a team of people, um, and we've looked at every every aspect of clean clean fuels. There's ordinary ethanol, which um, uh, you know, which uh, it comes from the fruits, um, you know, the the, cor the corn, the, um, the, the, uh, the the grain, etc., uh, the sugar, um, uh, and and that now with fuel prices at um, eighty dollars a barrel is is a, is a very very profitable substance to produce. It's about fifty percent more environmentally friendly than uh, you know than, than um, dirty dirty fuels are, um, and. Uh, and then we, we, we looked at something called cellulose ethanol, which is basically um, uh, the, the, the waste product that's left in the, in the fields. Um, and if you, can use, you can use enzymes to break down that waste product. Now, the advantage of cellulose ethanol is it's 100% environmentally friendly. Uh, and you know, if you, in, in your cars, use metal rods instead of rubber rods, um, you can use 90% cellulose ethanol or, or ordinary ethanol in your cars. You can do the same in trains. Uh, in buses, um, so we, we could actually re replace 90% of, um, uh, of fuel needs uh, with cellulose ethanol, and there's enough waste product out there to do so. Uh, it just needs the best enzymes to break it down and make it economically viable. Now that's not quite there yet, but it's something which we're investing money in trying to you know, speed up that process. Um, and then, then obviously we're looking at things like wind power, um, we, you know, we're looking at solar, solar power, um, and we're also even looking at sort of setting up companies which can help, you know, families, you know, if somebody wants to be in an environmentally friendly home or a factory or, um, you know, just to have a number they can ring so they can actually get the advice because I think a lot of people want to help, but there isn't actually, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a good business for somebody here to set up anyway if we don't all come and do it with us. But, um, <laughs> But um, but the interesting thing you know the interesting thing was you know um, that suddenly we realised that actually um, the alternative fuels could be as profitable as conventional fuels maybe even more so and uh, so you can actually run it run a good business you can sort out the environment uh, and maybe even bring fuel prices down so 
um, you know, so can, is, you know, it could be a win-win-win situation. Perfect. Why do we go to two? We'll we'll do. And then we're going to move back a, a, after this to the back of the room. So I'll Richard come back Steve. there. Sorry, it's Richard Stevens. I was on the senior executive program in 1999. Um, taking you back to your roots, um, you had a passion for music. At some point, you took that next step beyond that. How long did that take? What was that decision, and how did you reach it? Uh, well, um, we had a very successful record company, and um, you know we had people like the Rolling Stones, Janet Jackson. It was it was going extremely well. Uh, we set up uh, companies around the world, um, so that we had our own own companies producing our own music around the world, um, and. Uh, and I spent a lot of time on aeroplanes, and the experience, this was 21 years ago, was dire. I mean, it was, um, you know, you, you had, um, you know, people who obviously weren't enjoying working for the particular airline, they never smiled. Um, you know, a, a lump of chicken was dumped in your lap, if you were lucky, halfway through the flight. Uh, you know, there was, you know, no entertainment whatsoever. You know, you couldn't, no, no, no films. And, um, and, and, you know, it was dirty. It was just like you're, you're treated like cattle, sh you know, shipped from A, a to B. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I thought, you know, let's, you know, maybe we can create um, the kind of airline that I'd like to fly. And, um, and I sat down my fellow directors at Virgin Records and told them that I'm thinking of going to the airline business. And, um, and, um, the person who I thought was my best friend <laughs> was no longer my best friend. Um, no, I mean, they, they obviously thought I was, uh, uh, I think the words megalomaniac, heaven knows what was uh, used <laughs> over that lunch. Um, so I knew that I had to convince them that I wasn't completely insane. And I'm sure that at the London Business School, they, they, they teach you about um, protecting the downside, uh, you know, trying to make sure that, you know, that, that any, any move you make is not going to bring everything collapsing down around you. Um, so uh, I rang up Boeing and um, said to Boeing, do you have any second-hand 747s for sale? <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and they'd never heard of this company called Virgin or Richard Branson. And um, Anyway, I, I, managed, I managed to do a deal with Boeing. I said, you know, the, you know BA, you know, dominant in England, there's no other alternative competitor. You know, just, just give me one plane for 12 months. Um, if it works out, you know, we might buy lots of planes off you. If it doesn't work out, you know, we'll hand that plane back to you. And that, you know, by knowing that I could hand that plane back at the end of the first 12 months, I knew, you know, what the maximum amount of money I could lose was in that first 12 months. I knew that our profits for the record company were, you know, it was about 50% of our profits. So it wasn't going to bring everything crashing down. And it gave, it gave us a chance to, you know, see, see whether I was right that, creating the kind of airline that I was planning to create, whether, whether that it would work. Um, and then after 12 months, you know, fortunately, people like Virgin Atlantic and rang up Boeing and said, give us another plane instead of taking that one back. Um, and, and, and then it just grew, you know, grew, grew from there. Um, when we only had that one plane, Anthony Sampson, who's, uh, some of you may have read some of his books, who was doing a book about the airline business, and uh, he rang me up and he was talking about airline safety. and. Uh, my response was, well, I suppose with, with one plane, we'll either have the best safety record in the world or, 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 the, or the worst. Hi, I'm Peter Conlon. I'm in the uh, first year uh, MBA class. Um, one of the greatest things you've been able to create is this, this tremendously powerful brand. Um, well, how, well, when that started, that sort of started as sort of a low-cost, sort of alternative, um, almost anti-establishment brand. How have you been able to develop that over time to take it up to be applicable to luxury products? Because you now seem to have the full spectrum of um, products in your sort of portfolio. Yeah, I mean, when, when we started, I was never uh, conscious of uh, creating a brand. Um, you know, we, we, we um, just were, you know, I was wanting to create um, uh, magazines or record, record shops or record company um, hadn't really, you know, realised that in you know, that, that over time we were actually creating quite a potent uh, brand in itself. Um, we're obviously an unusual brand in that, uh, you know, if you look at um, 
say, you know, the, the other sort of 20 most successful brands in the world. You've got, you know, Coca-Cola um, specializing in soft drinks. You've got Microsoft specializing in computers. You've got, you know, Nike specializing in shoes. Uh, Virgin is more, um, has become a way of life brand. Um, and I suppose that's because over the years I'm, I'm inquisitive. I love uh, new challenges. I love, you know, taking on uh, big established players in, in big established sectors and seeing if we can um, move, move in, in on their sector and hopefully make sure that that sector is never quite the same again. So, you know, whether it's the, you know, the airline sector or the train sector or the you know, mobile phone sector or whatever. Um, and and we'll, only, you know, we'll only move in into a sector if we know that um, you know, we can make a real difference, if we can bring um, you know, better quality, if we can bring better value, if we can have fun shaking, shaking up that industry. Um, you're right. I mean, when we started, it, you know, with, with uh, Virgin Records, we were based just on price. And, and, um, uh, and that's, I think, quite a, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to lift a brand from a, a price-led brand, um, you know, low-cost um, brand into, into high cost. I think it's, easy, it's easier to start the other way around. Um, but in, in time, I think things like Virgin Upper Class product, you know, where, where, where in the airline industry we stood out as offering, you know, the, be the best business class product, that, that helped sort of lift the brand. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I think we're now perceived more uh, as a brand that's gone for quality, but, uh, but, uh, but offering uh, good value rather, rather than, say, an easy jet, which has really gone for, uh, you know, low price, uh, right, you know, right across, the, right across the brand. And, and it's easier, I think, if you've got a, a brand that is synon 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 synonymous with quality to then offer um, f uh, good value as well. But thank you. Hi, um, my name is Melanie. Um, Virgin in, in Latin America is still um, a very mild brand compared to the rest of the world. Is there any um, plan to move to that region or? You're right. Um, and it, it, it's strange uh, that, you know, almost every, every other country in the world, Virgin is now established and uh, Latin America, we're, we're not. And not, not, not even one little bit, I think. Um, and, you know, we started, Brazil obviously is a country which is, um, is really happening and, and is something as a country we're looking at. Um, uh, but often it's, you know, often the way we've actually get going in the country is, you know, is an individual or some individuals from a particular country come to us and, you know, they say, well, you know, we can, we can take a particular business that Virgin's doing there and, you know, and if we like the individual, we'll say, well, you know, go ahead and get on with it. Um, so come, come and see us. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Aspion Castanegard. I'm a full-time MBA student at school. I was wondering, uh, what are your criteria that you use to evaluate the feasibility of an investment? And also, um, how do you decide when is a good time to sell? <laughs> um, well, the, 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 with, with Verge, the, you know, our brand is incredibly important to us, so we won't go into a new investment unless we think it can en enhance the brand, um, and, uh, and, and, and unless we think we can make a real difference, as I said earlier, in, in that particular sector that we're going into, um, and, uh, and unless we think we're going to actually enjoy it, because you know, I mean, I mean, you spend so much time working, you might as well have a, have a good time. Um, so. Uh, and unless you know the individuals who've come to us with the project or um, are people we're going to get on with, and we and we feel um, uh, you know the, are the right people, um, you know if all those criteria fall into place, um, we're, I'm more likely to give it a go than not. Um, and um, uh, and perhaps say you know one of my faults is I think maybe I say yes too too often, but we just love love a new challenge. Um, as far as um, selling is concerned, um, we often sell things at such a time, you know, because we're because we're not generally we're a group of companies is a private group of companies, and we have although we have one or two public companies, 
Um, we, we normally, you know, we'll sell a company once we feel it's reached maturity um, and, uh, and, and at, at, at a stage where we can then, you know, um, reinvest in starting up new businesses. Our, our main skills uh, is starting businesses, um, you know, not running, you know, uh, large businesses. And, uh, and I think we, that's what we enjoy most. So I don't think we've ever bought a business. I think all, all, all our businesses were, you know, started off as little acorns and, you know, we've grow, grown them from scratch. Um, and, and, and I also often sell with reluctance. I, I mean, I mean, Virgin Records, um, we had British Airways determinedly trying to put um, uh, the airline out of business. And, you know, the, some of you may have studied the Dirty Tricks campaign that they uh, waged against Virgin. Um, and I had to sell Virgin Records in order to combat that, that campaign from British Airways. And I remember running down the street, having just told the staff that, um, you know, that I'd sold and passing an evening standard headline, which says Branson sells for a billion, um, with tears streaming down my face and thinking if anybody could see you know, me, me sort of sobbing my head off in, in this headline, they'd wonder, they'd, they'd send me off to a nut house. But anyway, um, but um, no, but I mean, selling things can be difficult. If you, if you build up a company where people matter, then you're selling people, so it can, it can be it can it can be quite tough as well. Hello, I'm Claire Thompson. I was on the Sloan program in 2003. Um, just following on from that, how do you keep control of the brand, especially if you're selling off businesses? And secondly, have you ever found yourself in a situation where the brand might have been damaged by something going on that you had no control over? Uh, the yeah, I mean, con keeping control of the brand is critical, and we we have a um, brand company that enters into um, brand licensing deals with you know with all the companies, and um, and generally speaking, we try to make sure that we um, I mean, it's you know the, the amount of companies we've sold is about three out of the two hundred and fifty, and and they're not. The kinds of companies I think where you could they, the people could do a lot of damage to the brand. There was one occasion where we licensed the brand for gas and electricity, and um, and we very very quickly took the brand off the people we'd licensed it to because uh, you know it's a risk it's a risky business you, do, you know door to door selling of gas and electricity can go horribly wrong and it and it did and we we we, and we, we, we but fortunately we you know we cut out the problem quite fast um, and. Um, uh, but uh, so the brand licensing deal is the way that we, we we protect it, and if anybody misuses the brand, we can take the brand away. Um, Adrian Gannon, uh, former student, current staff member. Um, one of the lessons we learn in the school is that all entrepreneurs make mistakes along the way, and. Um, the good ones recover from it and learn from it, and um, your successes are obvious. But uh, could you share with us one or two of your mistakes? You mentioned the electricity and the gas. I don't think that's one. But is there anything else that you have learned from, um, and you'd be willing to share with us? Um, how long have we got? <laughs> um, well, I've I've I thought um, that there were. Uh, lots of virgin brides and um, launched uh, virgin brides only to find there weren't any virgin brides. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, when, um, uh, when AIDS um, loomed its ugly head about um, 15 years ago, uh, Durex dominated the, um, uh, the British market and they had about 99% of the market and they were spending no, no money on advertising um, whatsoever. And um, so we, we, we thought the only way of um, encouraging people to wear condoms um, was to um, launch a condom company where we pledged all the profits back to, um, you know, back to good causes and, 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 and also to uh, promote the, the use of condoms. And so we launched something called, uh, called Mates. Um, and um, about three months after launching Mates, um, I uh, got a letter from one of our clients, and um, they weren't very happy something had gone wrong. Um, so I sat down and I wrote a long letter back, apologising profusely, and um, nine months later got 
beautiful letter with a, a lovely picture of a, a, little, a little girl asking if I'd be, if I'd be godfather. Um, anyway, we now have a, a, a lovely 12-year-old um, uh, goddaughter, and she's, she's, she's growing up well. So sometimes when things go wrong, there are, there are, there are good, the good things that come. My, my, my son was on holiday with me last week and we were um, uh, in, in the Caribbean and he went out with this, he's, he's 19, this beautiful 17 year old and he, the next morning I said, well, how did you get on? And um, he, he said, well, well there were, there were, there were four, four words she, she said at the end of the evening. So I said, well, what, 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 what were they? And, and, and they were, um, no glove, no love. <laughs> Actually, I think it would be quite a, quite a good, good, good name for a brand of condoms in the Caribbean, but anyway. Um, Julian Ha, uh, alumni board member. Um, so Richard, I'd be grateful if you could share with us your thoughts on one of the most exciting and fast-growing markets in the world now, China, uh, and maybe in particular, what plans you have for bringing various virgin brands into China in addition to the airlines, and also maybe your thoughts on the challenges and opportunities of doing business there. Thanks. Well, sorry, where are you from yourself? I'm from the States, actually. OK. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, Virgin's always, apart from maybe South America, treated the world as, um, as one, one country. And, um, you know, we've, we've, we've got a brand, which we never planned it that way. But, you know, fortunately, it works on a global basis. Um, you know, now, now when we're actually developing new products, um, we generally speaking won't go into a new industry unless we feel it could become a, a, a global industry. And, um, and therefore, uh, countries like China and India um, yeah, are, are enormous growing markets. And you know, if, you're, if you see yourself as a global player, uh, it would be ridiculous not to take China and India um, very seriously. Um, uh, China is, uh, it, it, you know, is is more difficult, I suspect, than than some overseas countries for um, uh, for non-Chinese people to invest in. And um, you know, we've we've set up our own team of people in China. Um, we're about to launch into the mobile phone business in China. Um, you know, we fly, you know, we fly to China to Shanghai, um, and we, and you know, based on how well the mobile phone business goes in China, I'm sure we'll develop. Um, develop other businesses there. Um, if you know Western business people do not treat the world as one country, um, we will be swamped. I mean, you know, China, the rate it's growing, India, the rate it's growing. Um, you know, we will soon become quite insignificant. The only way for us to stay significant is to actually, you know, be in there participating um, and 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 growing companies there. Um, and you know, we we plan to play our part. Thank you. My name is Wande. I'm on the Masters in Finance, uh, currently in the school. Um, what's your advice for young, intelligent Africans uh, who <laughs> yearn for opportunities to enrich their mind, make a difference in the world, but just at its disadvantage because they're on the wrong side of geography? Um, well, I, I love Africa, and I spend a lot, a lot of my time in Africa. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, we just sent up a a um, entrepreneurial school in in South Africa um, for um, what well, specifically aimed at Africans um, and uh, and I think Africa has um, you know has has a lot of opportunities um, uh, and it has a lot of an awful lot of problems you know, as well um, and uh, and uh, and in, you know I'm sort of sorry I'm sort of thinking of Country by country, because Africa is obviously made up of you know so many different countries with so many different different issues. Which country are you from, as Madam Interest? Nigeria. Nigeria. Okay. Um, well, Nigeria has has enormous opportunities, and um, I mean it's 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 obviously one of the um, richest oil producing countries in the world. Um, it's a great trading nation. Um, I mean we've, we we were asked by the president of Nigeria to set up a national airline for Nigeria, which, which, we, which, we're, which, which, we, which we've just done, called Virgin Nigeria. Because you know, without, without an airline, 
you know, a, a, a country really can't can't expand. Um, and uh, and you know, I think Nigeria Nigeria needs you know needs students who've you know studied well to go back there and um, and 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 build it and. Um, and hopefully, it, it, it's, it, it's becoming a less corrupt country because I think, you know, if you're fundamentally corrupt as a country, um, uh, society, you know, it's a very dangerous society to live in. I mean, if the, if the politicians of the country are corrupt, uh, then you'll find that the police start becoming corrupt. If the police are corrupt, you know, you get innocent people going to jail. Uh, you know, if, and, 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 and it just, you know, it just propels downwards. And, I think what Nigeria needs is, you know, is on, honest, you know, honest people running, run, run, running, running that country, and, and I think I think it's got a great future. The problems of Africa, the social problems of Africa, are enormous, and I don't think Africa can sort out the social problems on on its own. Um, and it needs, you know, it needs people from all over the world to to do their bit in trying to help address those problems. Um, I mean, we we. Uh, as a as a group of companies um, have pledged that none of us none of our staff will ever die from AIDS and um, and the way we're addressing it is to encourage uh, our staff in Africa to uh, you know test for HIV if they test positive uh, we'll make sure that they uh, get free antiretroviral drugs um, and uh, and the amount of people who are now dying uh, from AIDS at Virgins reduced from you know, an average of something like 25, 30% of, of local people down there to less, less than 1%. Um, and, and there's no reason why those people shouldn't live a, a, you know, a full, you know, full uh, productive life. Um, and there are one or two other companies in South Africa who have taken the same approach. Anglo-American, with um, a workforce of 150,000 people, uh, was losing you know, um, 30,000 people from AIDS. They've now reduced that again to less than 1%. Um, and again, it's one of those things which you know, a bit like ethanol, it's actually good business sense to be socially responsible. Um, you, know, you know, if you're losing 30% um, of your workforce, um, you're, you know, it's, it's immoral, but it's also, you know, means that people are, are going to be out ill, they're going to be going to funerals. I mean, it's a, it's a, a miserable existence. And, um, and I think, you know, one, one way of addressing the problems of Africa is for every single business to pledge that they will look after their own people. And, and, and then to try to you know try to persuade other businesses to do the same, and at least that you know that's a start. Um, but, um, but you know, but there's a, a long way to go there. Um, I think also that you know in Africa, entrepreneurs can can t play a part alongside um, the um, charity or charitable organisations in coming up with new, new approaches to problems like malaria. I mean, malaria, you know, kills two million. You know, um, children and pregnant women a year, um, and uh, and yet malaria needn't and shouldn't exist. I mean, it's just this tiny little mosquito uh, that, that that spreads it. And um, the the West um, uh, got rid of malaria by using DDT. The moment they got rid of malaria, uh, they effectively got DDT banned in in Africa, um, and. Uh, now DDT is, you know, it's, it's not as sensible to spread all over the environment. But if you actually paint it on inside your houses, there's no environmental damage. It kills a mosquito, uh, and 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 you can you can wipe out malaria in in you know wipe out malaria in Africa, um, and it just you know it just takes you know it takes properly properly organising. Um, anyway, good luck. <laughs> Hello, it's Anthony Rowe. Um, I've run my business about 20 years and came to London Business School about 15 years ago. Um, what I would like to ask you is, have you identified in yourself what your personal strengths are and what actually makes you so exceptional to everybody else? And not meaning to embarrass you, would you be kind enough to perhaps share that with us? Immodestly, of course. Um, <laughs> They, they, um, no, I think I mean the, the key. The, the, the key to I think being a good um, business leader is is your is how good you are with people. I think if you can care genuinely care about people, um, uh, and not just your fellow directors, but you know the cleaning lady, the switchboard operator, you know everybody throughout the company. Um, you know if you're a good you know if if, 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 if you know if you praise and don't criticize. Um, 
you know, people people will flourish. Um, and uh, so I think you know, it, 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 it's really your people skills that will set you, know, set you apart. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I don't think that can be over, overemphasized. I think um, just, you just got to, um, you know, if, if, I get, if I'm on a virgin plane, I will make sure that I always have a notebook in my pack, back pocket. Um, you know, make sure I get out and talk to all the staff. You know, if they've got issues, you know, make sure I don't just, you know, hear the issue and not write it down. Make sure those, those issues get written down. You know, talk to the passengers. Uh, if they've got issues, make sure those issues get written down. Um, uh, and in any one day, I'm sure in my back pocket, I'll have at least 15 different items. Uh, if I didn't write them down, uh, I mean, I had a meeting yesterday with somebody, and you know, there were issues after issues coming up, and I noticed they weren't writing them down. And I, you know, I said, are you, you going to remember them all? He said, yes, I've got, them, you know, I've got them all in my brain. And I just knew that, you know, that, that at least you know, half of the issues would just disappear. And, uh, and since a lot of the time I spend with my staff is actually propping up a bar at night times, um, I know that a lot more than half are going to disappear unless I write them down. So. <laughs> so Richard, Francis Tan um, from this year's Sloan program. I'm from Singapore. Um, just leading on your team about people uh, in your line of work, you probably have to size up the entrepreneurs that come and talk to you, um, choosing the people that to take the opportunity. So what are your criteria, your rules of thumb in selecting the people to work with and um, in interviewing them, what's the single most important question that you'll ask? Well, uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a great believer in promoting from within the company and not necessarily from promoting without. We do, we do on occasions bring people from outside, but the advantage of uh, promoting from within the company is uh, you know, people from within the company know that they've got a chance of you know, growing with the company um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and it can be quite demoralizing if you keep bringing people in from outside above people. And, um, so by the time we've actually promoted somebody, we know their weaknesses, we know their strengths, um, and you know we, 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 it's very rare you actually make a mistake. Um, on occasions we bring people from outside. Um, I used to I used to interview interview people. I'm not sure I was that that good at it. I always felt started ending up apologising for being such a bad interviewer. Um, but um, uh, but uh, you know again, I mean if if I'm if I'm doing the interview, I just want to be sure that um, that. Uh, that, you know that, that, that they will be good. You know, they will be good motivators of people. That they'll get around them uh, managers um, who uh, who care and um, and uh, and that's you know that's that's my basic criteria. There are other people at Virgin who I'm sure will be looking for you know different kinds of skills, but that's that that would be what I'd be looking for. Uh, my name is Shuri Shapte, I'm with Citigroup, but I'm an alumni of London Business School. Uh, Virgin is synonymous with uh, Richard Branson. So I've always wondered uh, how you persuade your board of directors to let you go up in a hot air balloon uh, for extended periods of time over expansive uh, water and things like that. Um, I just make sure that I own the company. So. <laughs> No, I mean it's it's um, yeah. I mean looking 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 back on my life, I, it, it, I've I've got a very um, uh, very understanding board of directors uh, and and parents. In fact, I've got my father here with me today, um, and um, uh, and uh, and I you know and, and it was in some ways you could say it was quite selfish uh, what I was doing. I mean it was it was magnificent and it was it, it put the Virgin Virgin name on the map on a global basis and. It was, um, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed doing it, um, but you know, I was lucky to survive, and I'm very lucky to be here today. And and uh, we came very, very close not to surviving on a number of occasions. Uh, whether I'd do it again if I lived my life again, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, it was, um, it, you know, I, I certainly, I certainly um, rolled rolled the dice, maybe, you know, a, a number of times. Somebody was being very kind to me, anyway. So, um, but um, thank you.
Could you, if I could just take you back to that question that you asked, sorry, Fraser LaGuardia, Financing Entrepreneurial Business course, the question about uh, selecting people. Um, I mean, you're very interesting on to the context of Virgin as it is today. But if I could take you back to where you, when you're starting out and putting, uh, choosing your initial team, the people you were going to build your business with, how did you go about that? And in hindsight, what would you have done differently? If anything. Well, I was um, yeah, 15, 16 years old at the time, and it was basically just looking for anybody who was willing to work for nothing <laughs> um, and, 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 and pay me rent for, um, for, <laughs> for a bed on the basement floor, uh, which was literally almost what it was it was. So, um, and if I, uh, if I met a Dutch girl, she'd become, um, you know, I would point to the Dutch foreign editor of my magazine. If I met a German girl, she'd be the German editor. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, and uh, anyway, we were just having we were having a lot of just a lot of fun, and we went we, we never thought of thought of ourselves as running a business. We wanted to uh, grow a magazine to change the world. It was late sixties. There was a Vietnamese war going on, um, and uh, and you know students wanted a voice, and um, uh, and we really thought we could we could change the world, and. Um, and to an extent, you know, we managed to stop the Vietnamese War, I think, or had, had all played our part in it. So, um, so mar marching on the American embassy, um, and I suspect there's some people who wish we'd actually all managed to stop another 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 war that's going on at the moment. But there we go. Um, but um, but, in, but you know, but but in um, you know, when you're starting out in business, I think it's. Um, uh, you just want you want a group of people. You you want to all make sure you get on really well together. Um, I, w I once had a cousin who popped in from South Africa. He said he knew a lot about music. Uh, asked him, you know, how big a record collection he had. Uh, he had. He said he had something like two thousand records. Um, so I immediately pointed him to run a, a new record company, which we hadn't started, and it turned out to be a good choice as, as, it, as it worked out. <laughs> I'm going to take one more question, and then I'm going to ask a question which will lead us to the film. So let me go um, back over there. Uh, yes, right there. Hi, I'm Nigel Boyce, second year EMBA student. Um, today, Tesco's results came out, and they were doing very well. And in Britain, there seems to be this kind of thing about if a company is too successful and it's too dominant in its marketplace, it's not a good thing. So there's always a backlash. Does Virgin ever actually consider whether they're becoming too successful in the marketplace? And do you think there is a concept that a company can be too successful? Uh, yes, I think a company uh, can be too successful, and that's what um, governments are there, there to protect against. Um, uh, you, 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 um, I think it's not in the interest of consumers. Um, it's actually not, most likely not in the interest of the company itself. Uh, if you become if you become too dominant, um, and uh, and governments must um, uh, under all circumstances do everything they can to avoid um, you know to, to avoid people dominating a marketplace, um, and uh, and you know and, and if Virgin ever become dominant in any particular sector that we're in, uh, you know we we would expect the government to uh, you know to, to intervene to try to make sure that. Um, you know that, that we do not become too dominant. Uh, even, even you know, to go to the length, the, the length of say, you know, splitting a big dominant company into two. Um, and in, interestingly, I, you know, I mean, when when Virgin started many years ago, uh, and every time our record company got too big, you know, we, you know, I would go in and I would say to the deputy managing director, you are now the managing director of a new company. I'd say to the deputy marketing manager, you are now the marketing manager of a new company. I say to the deputy sales manager, you're now the sales manager of a new company, and we kept on breaking breaking Virgin into uh, small new record companies till we had about 20 of them, um, and you know with, with those 20 people enjoy working for smaller companies, and, and those 20 small companies I think were that much stronger than you know, than one than one big company, um, but you know in the, in the specific case of Tesco's, you know it, it's really for the government to decide. You know, is, is is it is it in the interests of the consumer? You know, what's it doing to the smaller the smaller retailers? Um, you know, and and the fact that they've grown organically, do they therefore get away from you know from uh, you know from from a, a monopoly um, investigation or not? Um, 
you know, are they treating farmers correctly? You know, I mean, they have become very, very, very powerful. And, and you know, it's, it's an interesting question as to whether they've become, uh, become too powerful or dangerously powerful. Um, and um, so I don't, uh, you know, I don't think that might is always right. I think you've got, you've got to have governments there to balance the books. Thank you. Okay, um, we have the opportunity, if you'd like, to see the film about Galactic. Would you would you would you enjoy it? I would love to. I've heard it's a great film. So, as I said at the beginning, uh, the next uh, frontier for Sir Richard is space. Uh, uh, he's gotten pretty close to that already, but this is the next frontier. And there's a a, a short film about his venture called Galactic. Is that right? So uh, maybe we'll see it. We've been fortunate enough to have achieved some pretty extraordinary things at Virgin over the years, but perhaps none quite as amazing as what you'll see in the next few minutes. Virgin Galactic is now well on its way to becoming the world's first commercial space line, thanks to Bert Rutin, Spaceship One, and those flawless history-making X-Prize flights. The day that Bert won the X-Prize was a hugely significant one for us. When it was all over, I remember chatting to Brian Binney, the pilot on that epic flight. It's got all the right elements to excite the people for all the right reasons. The ride up is momentous. The view at the top is hugely rewarding. The ride back down is pretty spectacular as well. The pictures are pretty dramatic, but the, the eye is so much more dynamic. You combine that with the other things going on, the weightlessness, it's pretty wonderful. The rocket motor ride is pretty memorable as well. You're not going to soon forget that, especially the ignition. You, know, you get three Gs on your back instantly when it lights. And uh, boy, that first 10 seconds. About the most dynamic flying I've ever done. When you look out the window and you see the curvature of the Earth and you can see the edge, along the edge of the Earth, you can see this thin blue line that is the atmosphere. And the colors and the textures on the ground, and it's just, it's a, it's a mind-blowing thing to see. It really is. I mean, I'm sure everybody who's been in the shuttle or on the space station knows the same thing, but I'd never seen that before, and it really, really was a remarkable experience. We have the right technology. We have committed the funding. And importantly, we bring an enormous amount of operational expertise that comes from years of carrying millions of passengers in comfort and safety on our aircraft and trains. Every day, people from all walks of life and many different countries are making reservations with us to experience space for themselves. Our first Virgin Galactic astronauts will be booking their own place in history as pioneers of a new space age. We are in the process of optimizing, absolutely optimizing the experience that you will have when you fly in space. And it's just going to be fabulous. Well, I hope you'll be as excited and inspired by Virgin Galactic's mission as I am. And see you up there. I expect this, uh, you're all going to have to work very hard, please. We're selling tickets now. <laughs> when's the okay. launch date? When can we, when's the first uh, ride? 30, 30 months done. 30 months? Yeah. 30 months. All my, right. My dad's going. You, still, you are coming, aren't you, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> he's on sticks. You won't need sticks up there, he's, right? <laughs> he, he's training as an astronaut now. Oh, he's training as an astronaut. Anyway, we want to give a, a tremendous welcome to you. Thank you so very much for uh, being with us today. Um, we, as I said, you have been someone who the students have wanted to have for a long time. We're very proud that a couple of our students this year have joined Virgin Unite. I'm sure some of our students will sign up for this. I, I don't think... I will, but I do actually believe... As long as you fly Virgin Atlantic, <laughs> it's your promise. I will forever. do that. I will do that. I will continue to do that. But um, it's, uh, I wouldn't normally believe in the mission of uh, space as a consumer product, but 
under Sir Richard's leadership, I do believe in it. I do believe it will happen. So thank you very much for being with us. We have some small traveling clothes for you, which maybe we'll see on uh, Virgin. Oh, no, no, this should. What are you saying? This should work well. This should work perfectly. It's <laughs>